Could you turn the... Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, that would be one good thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we are interviewing a David Rittenhouse, 2335 South Fort Avenue, apartment 1712, Springfield. Pardon? Well, it's a 23, and I'm married. <laughs> trying to bring to my dress. Okay. That's uh, 2835 uh, South yes, Fort. That's what I had. Yeah. Okay. Apartment 1712 in Springfield, Missouri. It is the 13th of March, 2012. Conducting the interview is Mr. David Winkler of St. Louis, Missouri, and Tommy Pike from Springfield, Missouri, both members of the Route 66 Association of Missouri. Okay. First of all, thank you for doing this. We really do appreciate that, taking part of your, your morning, uh, meeting a bunch of strange people coming into your home. So thank you for being gracious to meet with us. We really want to hear your story as well as your father's story. So you began to tell us a little bit about him writing his archives and the kinds of things he did. So wherever you want to start would be great. Okay. Um, well, the, the, the Route 66 book uh, that he wrote uh, was inspired by his life and his life had a tremendous amount of diversity uh, because of the things that were forced on him by the world. Uh, as mentioned, uh, he got out of high school right, right before the beginning of the Great Depression. And uh, with the, the difficulty of 10 years of the Depression and then the five years of war that preceded his writing of the Route 66 book uh, in 1946, uh, he was forced by the economy to go to a lot of cities looking for work, uh, to have to do a, a diverse amount of things as he went through his 20s. And all of this kind of built the Jack Rittenhouse that was uh, inspired to write the book. So uh, the book was just simply one of a number of things that he did. Um, they, he, he in, his, in his later years, became an, hist an historian. Uh, in 1940, uh, he started reading books on the Old West, was very much interested in the Old West because things that came on, and he especially loved Western biographies. Uh, he, he, in, in his later years, uh, he wrote uh, a memoir, which I have here, which covered his whole life because uh, he believed in the biography concept. Uh, he felt that it was really unfortunate that so few people uh, knew what had gone on in the generations that had preceded him, other than perhaps their own mother and father, and maybe a little bit about their grandfather. And he saw that the world was changing rapidly, that every decade was radically different from every decade before. And so, because of his love of reading biography books of sheriffs in the 1880 and so on, uh, he felt inspired uh, when he was in his 80s to write this book. And he urged each of us to do a biography. Um, I, in fact, am I'm doing a biography that this thing here kind of inspired me to get back to, uh, which is a full family biography, which will not only cover my life going through, but before me I'm going to put in my father's story and my mother's family uh, also was heavily covered in the Depression. Uh, we were once very rich through the 20s. Uh, my grandfather had his own business and... Uh, Where did the family start? What, what state or cities was this all starting in? Uh, basically it all came from Fort Wayne, Indiana. Okay. Uh, my, my mother's family uh, came from Germany uh, in the early, early mid-80s. And uh, her, the, the Scheer family came over from Germany, 
and that brought down to my grandfather. And then uh, my mother, uh, her grandmother was uh, from a family by the name of Kinsey. The Kinsey family goes back to the Civil War, uh, not to the American Revolution. Uh, so she's a daughter of the American Revolution. And uh, they, they went to Fort William, Indiana, because Fort William, Indiana was kind of a gathering point for a lot of the German people. Uh, my father's mother uh, was born in Michigan, but uh, she married a guy who lived in Fort Wayne, Indiana, too. And so uh, she ended up going there. So Fort Wayne is kind of the uh, major home place. Um, my, the Grandpa Shear uh, bought a, a, a an ice house because he was familiar with black ice and cube ice at a company he'd worked at and became one of the major suppliers of uh, black ice. And of course, those days, the ice box was actually an ice box with ice in it. And he was making money, and then his son, my grandfather, uh, had uh, four kids, and he had a big home in Fort Wayne where he had a retail store out in the front and then the residence in the back. And in those days, uh, whole neighborhood stores was very common. Uh, people in those days uh, worked from paycheck to paycheck, and so a lot of times uh, they ran tabs at that store. And uh, he made a good deal of money. And when, 19, when 1929 came around, both of them were very well to do. But unfortunately, both of them had all their money in one really big bank. And when they crashed, uh, that bank just shut the doors and walked away, and they lost everything. And then uh, they tried, both grandpas tried to stay in business, but they went out of business. Uh, and the result was is that by the early 30s, instead of being big time people, uh, they were down in poverty level type stuff. And so there was a, a, a level of poverty on my mother's side, and my, uh, my father's father uh, just worked for a living in a big company in town, but then he got laid off and all this stuff. So. When my father decided in, uh, uh, in 1929 that he would go to college, he had a scholarship at Indiana State, they had a teacher's college. But he'd have to support himself by doing something to, for room and board. So he did a variety of things. Uh, he was very skilled. Uh, about the time he entered high school, he discovered uh, scouting and just fell in love with Boy Scouts. My father had the ability, which I sort of have inherited from him, and I think my oldest boy has inherited from him, that um, when he gets really interested in something, he just throws himself into it. Uh, and my father just threw himself into scouting. And in the four years of high school, uh, he went through scouting and earned every merit badge that scouting offered. Wow. And he was at every level of scouting uh, through there. And in his biography, he wrote that as he looked back, the, the one thing that was the most beneficial to him in his life was scouting. Because he said scouting uh, and all the different Thing, very bad subjects that he got involved with uh, gave him a lot of diversity and he was able to do them all either adequately or well or really well and it gave him uh, a, a, a feeling of confidence so that by the time he was of college age um, the, the thought of supporting himself kind of frightened him but he just felt hey I can do this and he went into it. Uh, one, of the, one of the interesting things that I thought, which leads to him, is that he made uh, models uh, out of balsa wood, black balsa wood. Uh, 
especially ships. For some reason, he found ships to be a real good. He made battleships. And he carved the little gun barrels, you know, which were an eighth of an inch long, and they glued them in there. And then he, he put them in a little enclosed case, and he sold these to the teachers and so on, and made money that way. Uh, but he, he, was, uh, he, he was always into books. Uh, years later, he would be tested uh, by an organization which tests your aptitude, your attitudes, and different things, then develops your IQ and so on. And um, he had a, 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 the ability to read and write and talk and that was off the chart. One day later when I was uh, in, co when I got out of college, he sent me to a place that did that. And when I came out, we were riding away from there, and reading the report and said I had an IQ of 128, which is just kind of average. And I said to him, what's your IQ? And he didn't answer specifically. He said, well, there's a funny thing about IQs. He says, they mix it all together. And in my case, when they tested me for vocabulary and uh, language skills, uh, I was at the top of where I could go. I couldn't go any higher. So when they fed that in with the other stuff, I ended up with a number that I'm embarrassed to talk about. <laughs> he said, but you know, except for my language skills and writing and stuff, I just think of myself as an average bozo, you know. But he had that at a very early age, and by the time he got to high school, uh, he was reading constantly. He was kind of like a proctor of the high school, of the library, all through high school. And uh, in his uh, senior year, uh, he worked for the public library as a part-time job. And so uh, when, he, when he went to college, uh, one of the things that he did uh, to make money was that he wrote a review for the uh, Fort Wayne newspaper, review of all the books that came out. Uh, he didn't get any money from the newspaper for all these book reports, but they gave him all the books. So after he reviewed it, he sold the books to make it <laughs> you know, And uh, that kind of stuff. So he went on there for two years. Interesting thing he told me was that uh, he, he lived in a kind of college boarding house. And one of the guys that lived in the boarding house with him was Burl Ives, the folk singer sure. and later movie actor. Mm -hmm. And uh, he and the guys used to go up on the roof of the house in the hot summer evenings, and Burl would sit up there with his guitar and sing all his folk songs and stuff. Uh, for a couple of years, he and Burl would exchange Christmas cards, but then they fell off in obscurity as Burl became famous in his own way. After two years, um, it was, uh, my father, this was 1932, beginning of maybe 33, and uh, he was just worn out from the, uh, the difficulty of trying to make money in an economy where there wasn't any money. And uh, so he dropped out of school. Uh, it, was after, it, it was after his third year, that's what it was. Um, and I think he started in the, well, I don't know, but anyway, um, he, uh, he later wrote that dropping out of college was uh, detrimental to his overall career. He says, because as he tried to go on and get a really good job, the absence of being able to say, I had a college degree, hurt him. But uh, he entered into a period that he called his wander year. Um, he first started out, he wanted to, the, the war in Europe was starting. Germany was invading different little countries in the beginning. And he wanted to be a war correspondent. Um, there was, uh, it was part of that. My, my grandfather Shear had a brother. And the brother had a son uh, whose name I think was Robert Shear. And Robert Shear went to London and uh, in the late 30s and early 40s, 
uh, there were two or three guys who came on in the evening on the radio, right? Uh, Calton Bourne and a couple other guys. And I think, I can't remember the guy's first name, but I think uh, he, this is Robert Shear from London, and, and my father uh, wanted to be a war correspondent. He went to Canada and uh, tried to go through Canada because it would be convenient to, to get uh, over here. And Canada turned him down. The uh, reason was the economy was so bad in the United States that a lot of people were leaving the United States and going to Canada because Canada had a better economy. Mm -hmm. And so they were putting a boycott on the, the uh, eight, there's a million Americans trying to cross the line and get into Canada. Came back and he went to New York. Because of his love of books, my father uh, was fascinated by book publishing. And so he decided that if there was a career that he wanted to do, he wanted to get into book publishing. And New York was the kind of like the center of book publishing. And so he went around to uh, all of the uh, publishers and put in resumes, and were, no one was interested. Um, he, he lived in all kinds of weird ways in New York. He, he found a job at, um, at a used bookstore, and he was paid, I don't know, 15 cents an hour or something like that working there. Uh, but they let him sleep on a cot in a room in the back. So that was where he lived and where he worked. Uh, finally, he also sold peanuts at Madison Square Garden. <laughs> uh, and then after a while, he got a job as a barker in front of a burlesque store in Times Square. A blessed the show, theater, and um, made enough money to get in an apartment. And while he was in the apartment, uh, he, he uh, talked to the janitor and made a deal that uh, all the people sent all their trash down a trash chute. And he told the janitor, any books or magazines or things they send down, put them aside for me, and I'll give you a uh, penny for a Life magazine and two cents for cars and stuff. And uh, he got those things from him. And he went down the street to all the other apartment buildings and he made a deal with those janitors to get their stuff. And every week he'd collect the stuff they had, take it to his bookstore, and the guy would buy it off of them for two or three or four cents a piece and then resell them to the people. So he, he did all that kind of stuff. Then finally, he, he decided that New York was just too cold. He was standing out in front of that, that burlesque place and freezing his <laughs> wits it off. And he said, this is it. So he, he headed south with another guy who went down to New Orleans. And they spent six or seven months in New Orleans. And uh, he did a lot of things down there. Um, one of them uh, was that uh, he, he became an on-street artist selling his work to people coming by. As he described it, what he would do would he would go to uh, like postcard places that had black and white scenes on the back. And uh, they bought a little cheap paint set, watercolor set, and he would paint about half of it sitting in his room. And then he would go out on the street and then he would finish what was left of it with the people standing there watching him do it. <laughs> and then he would sell them for 50 cents a piece or something like that, quarter, and pick up money. Uh, while he was down there, he got interested in magic. There was a, magi a magician that was living in one of the communal, like, uh, what they call beatnik type places that uh, he was in, and this guy taught him the basic tricks of magic. Uh, and after he finally ended up uh, with doing all the different stuff he did in New Orleans, he met a, a traveling carnival. And he talked to them about, why don't you have a, a magic show at the carnival? And they took him on. And uh, he, did a, he did a little, little um, stage show where he did the stuff. 
but along with that, they had a deal called uh, Buried Alive that they, they pulled into a town and uh, they, they had a kind of a, well, no, I guess they actually, they would dig a pit uh, out of the field where a lot of these things were done. And they would put this thing like a coffin down in there. And they would say, the barker would say, come and see this man be alive on the opening, buried alive. And they would come there and they would lay him in this coffin. And <coughs> the, um, the coffin had about a 24 inch opening in the coffin. And uh, they put him in there and then uh, they would nail the lid on it. <laughs> I don't have any. I, oh, I, I forget. No, really. They hypnotized him first. And they said, we're going to put you in this coffin <laughs> and you, you will sleep. And they said, we will, you can come back on our last day and we'll dig him up. So they did that and they were in there and uh, there was in a tent type thing and they charged like 25 cents to go in and watch him down there. Actually, the way that the, the trip to it was that inside the place, uh, inside the opening, as you were lying there, uh, they had two, two little lights. One light was a reading light on the top of the book, and they had some books in there where you could just lie there and read the books. The second was a little red light down in front of them, and uh, any time that somebody came in, uh, the barker up front would put, would cook that pedal in the red light, would go on, my father knows somebody's coming, put the book down and <laughs> go back like they're sleeping, and then when the light would go off, would go off he could get back and he could read some more. <laughs> that man with a kind of a closed, uh, he, was, he was tall and thin in those days. And they sized the opening of the coffin so that he could get up and, and get out of that thing and then he'd go out and spend the night doing whatever he did. <laughs> go back the next morning. <laughs> you know, that's, that's how he spent a lot of, uh, of 1934, stuff like that. Um, finally, uh, he got tired of, of the whole thing. He, he kind of wanted to have a life once again. It was a lot of fun. And actually, the stories of his wander years and the stuff he got in um, just represent tremendous diversity. But one of the things that, that he, he talks about during that period was the fact that uh, although he was always broke, although he was always poor, and although he was always scratching, uh, he, he never felt poor. Because everybody was That's right. Yeah. You know, and uh, you know, he, he, he used to talk about the difference between a hobo, a bum, and a tramp. You know, one guy was just an educated guy down in his luck. Uh, the other guy was an average guy, but just kind of a I don't I give a damn type of guy. And another guy was a bad guy on the run, on the loose type thing. But, and they, they did a lot of traveling in rail cars and a lot of sitting around campfires with a communal stew and this stuff. And you go up to a house and you just ask for a handout or can I work? And you might get a sandwich for an hour or two's worth of cleaning out the barn or something. And he said that, that they hadn't thought of it this way. It, it, you, who you were and what you did was not connected with pride, it was not connected with shame. It was just the way it was, and if you chose to get out there and compete, you did, you know. And my father competed. And, I, you know, there's a lot of stuff that I just won't get into here because it was just interesting. But it was character building, and it was confidence building, and uh, he, he kept at it stubbornly because he believed in itself, which was kind of the combination of the scouting right. and the problem he got through. You could almost say that in his misfortune, he was very fortunate mm -hmm. because it built in him a resilience and a, 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 an ex exploratory attitude of what he would do in life. Uh, in 1935, he married my mother uh, because he went back to Fort Wayne, he knew my mother from there, 
and uh, he wanted some stability in his life. He wanted to try and get back into book publishing. And even though he was worse in 1935 than it had been earlier when he got out of college, um, he, he, he wanted to try and he wanted to be married. And my mother's family, their general store, uh, it was right on the edge of being out of business. My grandfather, his captive business was the people in the neighborhood because of the neighborhood general store. And around 34, uh, the cash and carry warehouse store came in. And if you had money, you could get down there and buy things probably 20% cheaper than in his place because he couldn't buy at the level of these big stores. So he lost a certain amount of his customers, but the cash and carry stores did not run a tab. So a lot of people stayed with him because he ran a tab. And also, uh, they would start getting behind on the tab, which gave my grandfather a problem because my grandfather, uh, he, he had a certain customer base, and if he didn't go along with him, and everybody was saying, um, I've been told over by Joe the mechanics place that they're gonna hire me as soon as the, this comes up. So he kept getting behind, and by 1935, uh, he was way behind, and he was getting to the point where he couldn't pay his creditors. And my mother told me that it was just so bleak around that household. She, by that time, um, she was uh, 19, going 20. And uh, she said, you know, I just had to get out of there. Fort William is so miserable and proud stuff. And uh, my father and my mother dated for a while, and then they got married. He told her, I want to go to New York and get in publishing. He said that the number one reason uh, why he fell in love with my mother was that she was the most beautiful girl he'd ever seen. Quite common to a lot of men. <laughs> he said, but also, uh, he said, this woman could get a dollar fifty worth of value for every dollar she ever spent. And, and she was, you know, her life had been kind of tough in the environment of the store, and, and she was, she seemed ready to handle the problems of being married in a tough environment. So they went to New York, and they stayed in what he described as uh, cheap apartments, but generally neat and livable. Uh, one of them, equivalent, they paid $2 a week for that apartment. And um, uh, she, were, she worked as an usher in a movie store, a movie theater, laying people down the aisle of their seat. She worked in a donut shop. She did different stuff. He went back to his old routine, did a lot of Barker stuff. Uh, and he went around to all the different book publishers. Uh, one day he was hired by Alfred Knopf, K-N-O-P-F, I guess, Knopf, I guess, mm -hmm. publishing, uh, to be in their mailroom. It was his job to uh, receive all the inbound letters, open them, see what the content was, put them in different piles, and then distribute them to people around there. The first thing that really impressed him was getting mail from all the great writers of the time who were published by that company. And he'd sit there and read what they said and read the way they wrote and all that stuff. And um, he really felt part of the business. Uh, and he also talked with other people about book publishing as a, as a job. Spent about uh, six months there. Two things happened in that six months. First thing that happened uh, was that all the people he talked with told him, uh, Jack, book publishing is not really for you. Advertising is for you. Book publishing, you're going to find dull. And also book publishing right now is kind of a bad industry to be in. But you know, you would like advertising a whole lot more because you're very creative. Advertising loves creative. You like to write. You're not going to get the writing ability here at a book publisher as much as you will in advertising. 
and uh, advertising, as bad as it is, is going to fare better in this economy than book publishing. And he, he thought about that and accepted that, and he says, I'm going to scratch book publishing. I'm going into advertising. But after about six months between that attitude and the fact that he was just going nowhere, he was six months at the mail desk, uh, he wrote me memoirs that uh, he thought that his brilliance and skills and stuff <laughs> would cause him to rise up above the room. But he says, I just came to realize all the world was a man of guy, and that was it. So he, he quit. Uh, for, for the rest of the 30s, up until about 1939, uh, his life consisted of he and my mother going back and forth between New York, Chicago, Fort Wayne, uh, Terre Haute, different places in search of work in advertising. Uh, during that period of time, he found work for a short time, all sorts of stuff. Uh, I won't go through the rest of it. It was just much as like before. There was one interesting thing that happened during that period. Um, a little me being born. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, a time in 19, 1937, after uh, he had gotten laid off in a place, or, or uh, the place went out of business, they went back to, um, uh, to Indiana. During this period, when my grandparents, when my grandparents went out of uh, the general store, closed their house general store, had to sell the building and everything to pay off all the suppliers that they got in the hole on, they moved into their, what used to be called their summer cottage. Uh, my grandfather and his father uh, were carpenters and did a lot of building of stuff. And during the 20s, uh, my grandfather, who was making a lot of money at his store, uh, he and a small number of guys built uh, a five bedroom house by a, a place called Big Long Lake, or Long Lake as you go there, which was about uh, 30 miles uh, southeast of Fort Wayne, Indiana, near Kendallville. And uh, they would go uh, Saturday afternoon, he would close the store, he and the kids and friends of theirs and all stuff would get in his big Dodge touring car and drive down to this cottage on the lake Grandpa would immediately get in his flat bottom boat and start fishing, and the kids would have a party there over the weekend. When they moved in 1936 uh, into that cottage on the lake, the front of the cottage they turned into kind of like a 7-Eleven store. They sold milk and bread and uh, all kinds of uh, odds and ends of food stuff. My grandmother, her, her mother, uh, who was a Kimsey, uh, was a magnificent baker. Taught my uh, taught my my grandmother how to make donuts. I don't know what you can do to a donut, but everybody loved these donuts. And when they were far away at the store, uh, my grandmother baked all the time, and the donuts were a big item at the store. They uh, she started baking donuts again. And uh, her, the, their, my mother had, had two sisters and a brother. Brother got a uh, kind of like a van truck, went around Big Long Lake, and uh, gave away donuts in the beginning to all the people there advertising the store. Um, and then he went around uh, every day on a route uh, with uh, a small quantity of everything they sold in the back of the truck and was a local delivery man. See? That's how they supported themselves in the late 30s. That and the big, huge garden out in the back that all the sisters uh, attended, sold produce and stuff in the store. Uh, they, they went there to the Long Lake Cottage, which was kind of the rescue home base for all the kids when they get their nose bloodied out in the real world. And uh, Grandpa said, uh, you got a little bit of money, why don't you buy that log cabin we got down the way? 
about a half mile away from them. There was a fellow there who, uh, when times were good back in the 20s, started building a, a log cabin. And it was, it was like 25 foot long cedar uh, trunks. And they were laid one over the other with putty inside. And then the depression came and then he stopped the thing. So even though it was a framework and it had a porch on it and stuff, um, uh, it, it had no facilities inside of it. And the guy offered to sell it to my father for $300. Uh, my father gave him uh, $30 down and told him he would pay $10 a month for the next 27 months. And the guy said, you got a deal. So my father and mother moved into that place and uh, for the next year lived in that. Uh, no electricity, they carried some lanterns in there. Uh, they they had, it had a pump outside. They go out and they put water in pans and stuff from outside. No toilets, nothing. No primitive. While he was there, my father began going back into his book review thing, making money that way. Uh, he began writing and sending these things off to different publishers. Uh, most, of, most of the stuff that he wrote that was fiction came back. The one area of fiction that he found uh, he was getting sales in was in romance stories. <laughs> he would send these to the little, you know, like dime model things, and he sold a number of, of boy girl romance stuff. He also did some technical articles, because uh, he would, when he went into advertising, uh, one of the things that the advertising agencies found was that Jack had a highly organized mind. And uh, any time that somebody wanted to do a catalog, if it was a five or six page catalog, anybody there would do it. But if somebody came in and wanted to do a 40 page catalog, you said, give it to Jack Rittenhouse, he's the guy for big stuff. You know? um, in the process of doing that, Jack picked up uh, the ability to write technical stuff. And uh, he, 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 a lot of the stuff that he sold was technical articles for things, as well as uh, he did some reviews and different stuff in the papers. I got them through this year. Now, um, I, th I think back on their life through this stuff. My God, what a, what a, what a way to spend your married career, you know, living in a log cabin with, uh, you know, the, no electricity and no toilets and all that stuff. But they, and that's where I was conceived. Following year I was born in Fort Wayne, and um, in my first year or two, I probably had about half of my life uh, living with my folks when they would get settled somewhere. I lived in New York with them. I lived in Chicago with them. Uh, and of course in the log cabin and stuff. Uh, the jobs would last for a while, they'd move around. And then from time to time, my grandparents would get in trouble and I would come back there. So I basically uh, grew up uh, in my first three, four years in, in a highly wooded lakefront environment, uh, which may give me a, a lot of the country, which is probably one of the next big things right here. I am just something about being where I can drive down by the library and look out and see rising green hills and stuff. And one of the reasons why I like fishing in Bear Shoals, you know, the, the sameness of it year after year. But uh, they, they fought it through. And then in, uh, in the, I think his advertising age started in 1939. Uh, he came to Chicago, he, my mother, and I, and got a job with a guy in an advertising agency. Well, after about four months, uh, the, the, just wasn't going anywhere, and the guy got out of it. 
Jack decided to start his own advertising agency, Jack D. Rittenhouse Advertising. Uh, mostly he just did odds and ends of things for people, newspaper, he put it in, the newspaper for him and stuff. Then he got one outfit uh, that was a, uh, a company that was into real estate and they wanted to develop a, a major sales manual for, for uh, real estate salespeople to help them be organized and efficient when they would go to call the potential buyer of real estate. And uh, so Jack started working on that. Even though he did a few other odds and ends, they were his major client. And uh, he did it extremely well. In fact, he won an award from a real estate organization there as the best sales manual of the year for real estate. Um, by late 1939, uh, the, the market was down, uh, one thing was there, the client with the real estate thing was fading out, and Jack was starting to run out of business. He got talking with the real estate organization about the sales manual. They had had requests to know if they had somebody who could come out to their city and hold a seminar on the intricacies and different things of the sales manual and answer questions and discuss it. And because Jack knew it so well, I think I said to Jack, would you be interested in doing this? And he said, well, I'm not making any money anywhere else, me as well. Um, about that time, he bought a used 1939 Austin Bantam. Hmm. The Austin Bantam uh, looks a lot like the Mini Cooper that you see today, like in the Italian job. Uh, little small car, four-cylinder engine, two seaters, one, just one front seat, uh, an acceptable size trunk, had a top speed of 65 mile an hour, it coasted, it traveled best at about 55, he said, and got 55 miles a gallon. Wow. Uh, with, so, Jack said that they charged about, um, well, for a small seminar, they charged $100 a day for him to do it. Uh, for a big seminar with, uh, a lot of people, they might go down to uh, a, a different rate. But uh, he went off uh, on this trip, and this was his first trip down Route 66. Okay. In 1939, he left Chicago, and he had seminars in Springfield, Illinois, and St. Louis, and going you know, out west. And he traveled the whole length of Route 66 uh, doing this thing. Robbed in LA in the fall, uh, late fall of 39, a guy who had a, uh, a advertising agency in Los Angeles um, uh, talked to him and he says, uh, tell you what, I like the way you work, I like the manual you wrote. How would you like to, to come out to Los Angeles and work with my company? Uh, what I'll do is I'll give you a, a small base salary and then a commission on things that you do here. And he says, we do get a number of offers to, to develop a sales manual for people. And he says, I'll give you all the sales manual work that comes up. And so I mean, my father said, let me think about it. So he drove back on Route 66, which was his second trip on Route 66. Talked to my mother. And uh, she said, well, that's a job. So it was agreed that she would live with me with my grandparents in the beginning. And uh, this was uh, around uh, December of 39. And uh, the two of them, my mother and father, uh, left in early January after the holidays to go out to Los Angeles for trip number three on Route 66. I uh, got out there. He did, began working with his fellow. Uh, he did acceptably well. In fact, uh, my mother came back by train uh, in about February or so because they were sitting on the job and they'd rented a house, an old house out in the suburb uh, of LA. And she brought me back by train. 
And that was a good period. Uh, it was in that period that my father um, fell in love with California. Nice place to, <laughs> nice place to live. And uh, one thing that he liked about it was the, the, uh, the desert had all these ruins of Indian tribes. He would go out with some archaeological people and they would look for uh, obsidian arrowheads. And uh, they would go to uh, abandoned ghost towns and all this type of thing. And during this, uh, he picked up some of the lore of all the Western guys that were out there. And he began picking up books on the West and reading these books. And he was fascinated by the real story of Billy the Kid and sheriffs of 1870 and all this stuff. And that got him into Western stuff. And he just liked the look of rocky things and all that <laughs> stuff. And it, it began a love of the West that stayed with him until the day he died. And a desire to learn more about the West. And he would go to Western bookstores and pick up Western books. But uh, even though it was a great time for us as a family, because finally we're together, I had a tricycle. I had a little <laughs> car. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have stability. I have stability. And my mother was happy. We had a certain amount of stability. But there, there was something lurking in the bushes, which was called the war in Europe. Yeah. And the war in Europe uh, was after us. They, um, the result was is that when California, my father uh, went got called in for the draft board because the United States was building up their military army uh, and they turned him down because he had a heart murmur so he was rated 4F. But he was concerned, you know, a concerned citizen. The, uh, the individual states, especially those next to the ocean, uh, had their own state guard. Now, it was separate from the National Guard, which I guess was a form of the Army or something, but the California State Guard was a volunteer organization uh, that my father joined uh, so that uh, when the invasion came into California, which everyone in California expected, uh, that he would be able to uh, help serve the country. And then December 7th of 1941, uh, he immediately went down there when he heard on the radio that they'd been invaded. And as they moved into 1942, um, it, it, was, it was once again a bad year for business, as well as it was kind of a nervous year because of My father uh, was very active the first month or two in, in 42 uh, because everyone was the invasion thing. He spent most of his time down working there. They, they made him a lieutenant in charge of the mess hall. And so he spent those two months being sure that all the guys were fed. But by, by after the middle of March, everybody had pretty much seen that there wasn't going to be an invasion. And so then he went back trying to find business. Um, Thinking about that, I've got to tell you. I got to tell you a story about my father that relates to that National Guard thing. And then I'll get back to the to the main you know, trip. Uh, in in 1940, because of the potential of the United States getting involved in war, um, because it was a low technology era. There was a need to have communication all along the West Coast uh, so that everybody could be, the military and the National Guard could be put together. <laughs> so, <laughs> State of California began building radio towers. Uh, and all about every 50 miles or something like that up the coast, uh, maybe it was 100, I guess it was 50 miles, 50, every 50 miles to build a radio tower. Now, what they would do is they would go in and they would stop in the fire and they'd say, we would like to give you $500 to let us 
put a radio tower on your property. We will lease that property for the duration of the war if we get in a war plus two years. And, uh, and most of these just say, yeah, fine, I'll put you over there, yeah. And they put a cement pad, they put this radio tower up, and there'd be an electronic thing down at the bottom. And it's all done. So this existed all through the war years. Well, in uh, 1967, my father was living in California. And he had a buddy of his uh, who was an ex-Air uh, Force guy. and. Uh, flew Piper Cubs and that thing on the coast. And this guy loved uh, army surplus stores. He would go to these things and he'd pick up all sorts of things there. He and my father went to this uh, army surplus store. They had like an auction on some of these big things. Take bids from the floor. And they said, now we've got a thing here. Uh, we are offering you, I think it was like 20 radio towers. <laughs> he, said, he says, uh, the, the, we put them in back in 40 based on uh, five years plus two years. Old. Well, the lease expires on all these 20 radio towers uh, in two months. And uh, we would like to know if any of you would like to buy these radio towers. How tall are they? Um, 40 feet, 50 okay. feet, something like that. All, all steel channel and uh, angle iron all welded together. And he says, the problem is, you've got to get them out of there by the end of March because according to the contract, the uh, farmers or owners of them will uh, become the owners of anything that we don't remove. Uh, is anybody interested? And they were looked around and most people went, yeah. <laughs> but uh, my father's buddy looked at him and he says, yeah. So they offered a hundred dollars for him and bought the contract. And all for all 20? The whole thing, all 20. So <laughs> this place of steel ought to be worth more than that. That's what this guy said. Yeah, he said, next, next day, Jack and this guy got in their car and started running up there. And he said it, it, was, it was 20 different fun stories. He said, we, we'd go around the town, we'd go to the farmer, and we'd say, look, uh, we now own the radio tower. Uh, we're either going to take it down and get it out of here, or we'll sell it to you for $200. <laughs> and the guy would say, uh, you know, why is he? Yeah, I'll tell you, you give him $200. Or he'd say, no, don't mess with it. They'd go into town, they look for some kind of steel fabricator, they'd say, come here, I got something I'll show you. Take out their shrubs, tower, he says, 200 bucks, you got it, you know. Uh, he either took it, or sometimes they go to a second guy, and the second guy would come out and give him $200. They were gone for about a week, and they, they made $1,000 plus each for the sale of those towers. <laughs> this, this kind of thing is, is very typical of Jack Rittenhouse. Um, although he was cerebral and although he was intellectual and in the books and stuff, uh, and it goes back kind of like to the Boy Scout conference level, uh, all through his life, if, if something came to him and seemed like a good idea on which he could turn back, he would do it. He was always on the lookout for innovative things that would do it, which was kind of the thing that led up to the Route 66 book. But in uh, going back to the story, in, in November of 1942, uh, he and my mother just decided to, to get out of California and return back to Chicago. Uh, th there was a whole lot of reasons. That, the war and the economy was getting bad and the agency was working with one or another. And mostly my mother wanted to get back in around Chicago and Indiana to be with her family. Some things were going on there and she felt like she ought to be around to help contribute to the thing. So they drove once again, Route 66 from Los Angeles to Chicago in that little bedroom. Hmm. I remember riding between them. The Bowman had a, 
a gear shift in the center, and it had a little knob on the top of the steering, the gear shift. And it was like a barber pole or another. And I would amuse myself, uh, you know, I'm, by this time I was uh, about four. And uh, I was looking at that thing. They got back, and uh, my father ended up not even trying to go into advertising. He went into uh, a, a uh, electronic machine shop place. And he worked there at the machine shop. He started at 60 cents an hour. And uh, he was told that after he'd worked there for six months, he would get a raise. Uh, but he and my mother had an apartment there. And again, that was a happy period in Chicago for me. They, they made money. Uh, she, went, she went to, uh, if you're familiar with Chicago, mm -hmm. Uh, ever been to the Ford City Shopping Center at 78th and Cicero? I don't know where it is. I've never been there. I don't know where well, that used to be a, a, a Ford Motor Company okay. aircraft plant. And my mother got a job at the Ford City Aircraft Plant as an assembler or something. And uh, my father working there after the six months passed, he went into the boss and he says, uh, you know, my, my six months over, can we talk about my raise? And the guy said, what raise? He says, well, that's hard. I was trying to get a raise. And the guy says, uh, well, I think you're misinformed. You know, there's no raise. Same recruiter, that was. <laughs> yeah, the same, same recruiter. But you just had it. And my father says, that is not right. And the guy said, that's the way it goes. And, you know, you will be fired. I'll fire you. If you want to get back to work, get back to work. Well, my, my father's mother had been a, a seamstress at a woman's garment manufacturer in Indiana. And the union, the Ladies' Garment Worker Association, came to the plant and unionized the plant after a whole lot of razzmatazz. Uh, if you've ever seen Sally Fields in the movie Norma Ray, she went through a thing like that. And while it was going on, uh, they wanted someone to be uh, their business agent type guy or woman in the plant. And Jack's mother, who was kind of a hard ass type lady, she said, I'll be that. And so she represented all the women in the plant and sat in all the meetings of it. And so Jack uh, was not unfamiliar with unions and un unionization and stuff. So Jack, in his anger about the 60 cent raise, went down to the, to the electrical workers city business hall and said, uh, we are involved in mostly electronic stuff for heaters and things for stuff. Why aren't we union? And they said, well, we've just never gotten around you guys because you're only about 40 people, you know. And he says, well, I would like to get that place unionized so we'd have some representation when these guys try to screw us around. So he and the union rep went down there and uh, jointly put on a thing down there where three months later they unionized the place. And Jack got back at them for screwing him on his 60 cents. But by the end of 44, uh, Jack was just tired of going up to the same place every day and doing the same stuff and having no creativity. Uh, we just invaded Normandy and uh, he, he was seeing things loosening up in the advertising business. Uh, he wanted to go back to California and he wanted unionization. And um, my mother, on the other hand, after nine years of this stuff, uh, was just tired of, uh, of not having a base, and she wanted to stay in Chicago. Well, Jack had been uh, quietly falling in love with a woman that he met by the name of Charlotte High uh, for the last couple months, and he knew it was going to be a battle about California and Charlotte, Love Jack. And what did I tell Charlotte? Charlotte was actually more intellectual um, than my father, and he liked that. And, and she was just, Charlotte just thought my father was the greatest thing in the world. Um, 
So my father told my mother that he said, you know, uh, well, then I think we ought to split up. You know, you stay here, you know, I, I want to go back to California. And uh, I also met a woman uh, who I think I would like to marry and all this stuff. As a result, uh, they, they were divorced in July of 44. Both of them described it as an amiable divorce. Uh, neither one of them spoke badly about the other. Uh, my father told her that he would send her $50 a month support money for me until I reached 18. And you were about six at the time. Though. I was uh, five. Yeah. Five going on six. And uh, so he, he left, and in July, a month later, he married Charlotte, got on 66, and headed out to California. And uh, my mother uh, wanted to stay on her job at uh, Ford City. She took me to Indiana. So I entered uh, grade school in uh, a, a small, um, well, actually, it was, it was about a four-room schoolhouse. And um, that's where I spent my first grade. And, and uh, my mother stayed in Chicago when I was there. Well, then, <coughs> in, in 66, when my father got to California, uh, he. 66 or 40? Uh, uh, 46. 46. 46. Okay. I, was, I was distracted by a thought. Um, he went to uh, a, a large advertising agency called the Nielsen Organization. And he talked to the president and he said, I want to work here. Here's the stuff I've done. Here's the stuff I'm capable of doing. Uh, he named a wage that was so ridiculously low that the Nielsen president had to take him on. Of course, you know, in, in business viewpoint, my father had been out of advertising now for about three years, and before that, all he had was a record of, of going out back and forth, you know, soft. And so he had to buy his way in, he bought his way in, and he advanced fairly rapidly in this, and especially, uh, he says this, any, any time that it was a big project, they gave it to him. All the other guys did those. He was the big project guy. Um, he and Charlotte uh, bought a house then in uh, in '66, uh, just barely. It was '46. '46. And um, I'm trying to do one thing I'm organizing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was it was about that time that Jack noticed that a lot, the war had ended, soldiers had come home, uh, and the, the, the people were starting to move around. Uh, there were uh, projects being built of homes around the country, and 66 was getting to be a much more active highway. Uh, Jack, having driven it so much, uh, had all kinds of people coming to him asking him questions about, you know, uh, are, there, how, are there gas stations on there? You know, where do you eat? You know, and stuff. And he realized that there was a lot of uh, fear and trepidation in the minds of a lot of people about this journey. It was almost like Wagon's West concept, you know. And uh, he said to himself, you know, uh, if I could write a book on where the gas stations are and you know recommendations on places, again a guidebook of some kind to help these people travel, that would probably sell. Well, uh, starting in 19, well, I guess it would be 45, Jack got back into the Western books and things, and one of the things that fascinated him uh, was the early printing presses. And as he went around to different places, uh, he found a place that uh, was a print shop that got out of business and had a, an old printing press that was of the style that they used uh, in the late 1800s to print a lot of the early biographies that Jack was reading. And so uh, Jack bought the thing and he took it to their house and he bought a lot of type and in the evenings, he would like to go out and he, he set type for stuff. And he began printing his own Christmas cards and printing stuff with it. 
And uh, so when he got that idea, you know, he says, I think when I do this book, I'll write it myself, I'll set the type for it, and I'll print it, and I'll sell it myself. And so that was his concept. He was a complete publisher and everything. He was the whole deal on this first, on the first production. Writer, printer, publisher, bookman. And there's little maps in there. Mm -hmm. And he did little maps himself back there with uh, uh, wow. little, little things. And it was his own weekend and, and during the week project on this thing. And so. Uh, at this in in '46, he set off in the Bantam, and he drove to Chicago and uh, taking notes and stuff, and he came back. Uh, according to his reports, what he did in the beginning was kind of do an organizational layout of it. He spent about two months of um, uh, looking at the map and figuring where there were stuff and where there weren't stuff. And uh, you know, elevations of thing. For some reason, he thought what the above. I guess for, for mountains, you know, so it's when they're hitting areas. So a lot of these places, he gave the level of it because the, a lot of the old cars, uh, you know, had a tough time getting up some of these big hills. Not like today. You know, he had to, in fact, he, he wrote somewhere that. Uh, when they get in a place where you couldn't handle it in third gear, you put, you know, where you break and drop down your gears when you get to this area type stuff. And he would have put all the stuff of it to, to prepare himself for uh, filling in the gaps on his imaginary layout, which is probably the way he roughed out a catalog, you know. And when he started out, he, he put a yellow pad next to him on the car seat of the Bantam. Uh, and he would drive until he would see something that he, that he was interested in. He said he drove 35 miles an hour through the whole trip, pretty much. He would go as far as he could during that day. He would find himself a cheap motel. He had on his portable typewriter, and he would go in there, and he would type up notes of the day. So all these mile patterns are based on the Bantam, then? Based on the Bantam, yeah. And... Um, one well, interesting thing about Jack, uh, his manual dexterity was excellent. Uh, that's one thing I didn't inherit. <laughs> that's what I found out with guitar playing. But uh, he was a two-finger typist. And he said that uh, all through his working career, there was not a woman secretary in any business he ever worked at that could out-type him. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, when he got back, he went through and he published it. Uh, he, he was starting to get into some uh, organizations out there and through Nielsen and just Lifestyle, uh, he found various mailing lists where he could get in cheap, put the thing on it. And uh, I think he made uh, 3,000 copies of the first one. I'm not sure. What did he sell for? One dollar. One dollar. dollar piece, yeah. Which excluding advertising costs was all his. Yeah, so, uh, right. and then in the uh, later on, in uh, 1968, uh, he went to work for the University of New Mexico Press, uh, and then there were uh, in I think 1984 or something like that, um, they had. Uh, they had changed Route 66 to 44. Uh, is that right, like 1984? Is that right? 84 was when they decommissioned the last section out okay. right there Williams, Arizona, and Winslow along in there. The last section was taken out of the, was decommissioned. Very good. <coughs> well, he said what, when that happened, uh, the, the love affair of Route 66, the sentimentality of Route 66 started to surface. Uh, and he, he sold the rights of this book to the University of uh, New Mexico to begin publishing the reprints. Now, I don't know if this, that's still done today, mm -hmm. um, but uh, they were, and then that book came back on the market. How many books did he sell before he sold the rights to New Mexico Press? That was, that was the first book that he published under the, the heading of Jack D. Rittenhouse. Uh, 
I mean, uh, of this particular copy. He said 3,000 was the first printing. That was what he printed. That's, that's it. That was it. That's all he did. Oh, one time 3,000. Yeah, because... Um, so there were no reprintings of this until 1989 or whatever when uh, they did it. 84, I guess, when they sold it down, then they did it. There weren't any other ones uh, that I know of. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether uh, the first printing was sold out or when it was sold out. You know, after, after the like probably like 1950 or 52 or something. Uh, well, definitely after 52 because then Eisenhower came in with the, uh, you know, nice yeah. like highway system and Route 66 got much better. And of course, by that time in the 50s, you started getting the Holiday Inns replacing the thing and McDonald's replacing uh, cafes and so it's pretty rare to find the, one of the original ones. There's only yeah. 3,000 yeah. of them. Yeah, that's, that's not an original. Right, right. right. There. And you said you had an original. I, I didn't even. I had never seen this book, and at a flea market I found one. And I thought, well, i got to have that. And that was even back before there were any associations or anything. Mm -hmm. And I uh, picked it up, <clears throat> and then... Oh, in the early 90s, they began, they reprinted them and they were beginning to show up because, believe it or not, even though the interstate system had cut this, this book was still pretty accurate. Yeah, it was still good on 66. It just didn't tell you, like, where it was taken up, how to get around to cross the interstate to get to where you were going. But... It, it still had a pretty good market, and it still does, really. You get to areas where it gets void of the interstate, and you can follow it pretty good. It's it's still still a good book to have. Yeah, you, and uh, my oldest boy, uh, at one time when he drove Chicago, uh, exited the interstate and followed as much of the original 66 route as he could which is the big thing now, the interstate, you can find the old, a lot of the old 66 stuff here and there. And um, there's, a, there's a place uh, at mile marker 147 in Chicago. Uh, it's a big truck stop. Uh, I can't think, of, I'm skipping. The McLean. The McLean? Yeah, the, yeah, McLean. The McLean, yeah. It's at McLean. Yeah. And uh, they, they have a, a showcase out there where they put stuff in, and they had this book and this boy, my father, in there one time, and they rotated that and a lot of other stuff. Uh, the, when you go on the internet and you put in Jack D. Rittenhouse, you, you get up something like 12,000 <laughs> places to read. But on the matter of books, uh, there's this was his second book, which uh, he did in 1947. American Horse Drawn Vehicles. Yes. One of the one of the things about did he do the printing of this too? Uh, no. Okay. No, he. Uh, I don't. No, I don't think so because I don't think he didn't have the capability for all those plates. Um, what happened was, and this is kind of typical. My father was a collector. In addition to books, he collected other stuff. He told me once, he says, you know, if, if a man wants to have zested life, he should have a collector attitude. He says, because uh, then you're always alert. Um, he, he, because he fell in love with the West and uh, looking at Western movies and things and so on, um, Western books, he became fascinated by stagecoaches and wagons. Um, there are all kinds of different styles. Now, as, if you come down... Um, and that book was published in 48, uh, or copyright in 48. Okay. Uh, in, there's, there's uh, right after you pass uh, in 44 going into Oklahoma, very early in Oklahoma, there's a museum of guns, museum of handguns, yeah, Claremore. Um, where is it? Claremore, oh. Davis Gun Museum. Okay. I stopped in there uh, on, a, on a trip that I made, and a, a 45 caliber revolver was the mainstay of the West, but rather than, and they all basically look 
similar, if not alike, but there are probably uh, 250 versions of that because all you got to have is, is a straight hammer coming back as opposed to a curve hammer and it's a different gun. My father was fascinated by the fact that there's a wagon is a wagon, but there's a hundred different wagons because of all these changes to it. Um, so he started, he started thinking about doing this book. And so any place where there was any kind of old collector stuff or things around, he'd go and look at the wagons he had and research wagons and stuff. And he spent a lot of time on this as he was working on a whole lot of other stuff. He was a guy who just loved to work on things. But he would say, especially, especially when he got the fever, when an idea took to him that he really fell in love with, then he would just immerse himself in that thing, you know, for uh, a couple of weeks. The book is the only guidebook that he wrote in terms of traveling. That's right. Okay. Uh, he did this. And then, uh, jumping ahead to uh, 1959, in fall of 1959, he found himself once again out of work, not in a not in a bad way, but in a good way. A company came in and bought him out. Um, and so he, he had a dream that he had come up with about doing this. Uh, he said, if I, if I started writing limited edition books, uh, you know, uh, 400 copies, 500 copies, uh, that are written by me on things that I come up with that I find they're not written as stories available. Cabezon, is that what I call them? C-A-B-E-Z-O-N, a New Mexico ghost town by Jack Beaver. Cabezon. Cabezon, 1965, Stagecoach Press in Santa Fe. Yeah, he said uh, in, in the 50s, after he married Charlotte, uh, they would not only get in their car, but they sold the bedroom after it got to 100,000 miles. And uh, Bill and Charlotte would get in their regular car, and they would go out on weekends, and they'd drive around. And they, they liked Texas, but they drove into New Mexico, and he fell in love with New Mexico, because it had all these Indian stories, and these uh, old caves where people were in, there were various New Mexico bad men, and so they began vacationing in New Mexico. He would later claim that he and Charlotte had driven every highway in the state of Mexico from beginning to end. And he published, I mean, he did the printing for this book too, that Steve yeah. Jones Presses, he wrote Jack's book. He says, we will, move, we will move to Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I love, because that's the seat of New Mexico, or, and he says, we'll get a place, and I'll set up my press. I will write these books. I will set the type, I will publish these books, I will offer them to all the Western book people, and I will sell these, and we should be able to make a living on these things. And he went out there, and he published uh, over the next, uh, I guess it would be seven years, he published about 15 books. And they all sold out, and a lot of those books uh, can still be found uh, in the main registry, whether or not you could get a lot of them is something else. But by 1968, uh, the cost of them and different other stuff uh, had, had gotten in the, the way of making a living with it. And that's when he decided to get out of that business and go to work for the University of New Mexico, a part of it called the University of New Mexico Press. By going back to that, that book about um, the horse-drawn carriages, he published that, and in the process of um, being involved with the West, he got involved with the, all the Western associations of booksellers and people, and uh, he started going to some of their meetings and stuff. So he, he knew how to find it. So he, he sold out most of the copies of the university of that uh, horse-drawn carriage thing. Uh, if it impressed me, it was one day uh, at that time, 
He walked, uh, he made an appointment with Walt Disney Studios to go there, and he talked to the head of their research department. Now, when, when Disney did a movie, like all the movie studios there, uh, they had a research department that when they did a movie, they would, they would try and make it authentic with costumes of the era and equipment of the era and the sets that they built. So he went in and he said, stagecoaches and carriages, got the ultimate work here, gave him that book. He said, I've also got this suitcase of photographs and other stuff that we didn't put in the book. Uh, I will sell you the whole thing for X amount of money. And so they took him in to see Walt Disney and showed Walt what we had. And Walt looked at his research guy and says, we got anything like this? And the guy says, no. He said, all right, buy it. So wow. he gave my mother and father what he asked for. I didn't know what it was. But, uh, you know, during, during, this, during this period, as he was into books, uh, he began collecting every unique book on the West that he could run into. And he went into a lot of bookstores. This was part one of his collection addictions, you know, of which he had several. But uh, he would go through there. The West consists of something like <clears throat> 12 to 16 states. I can't remember what it is. It's like Colorado West, you know. And um, he had been collecting these things, and he, after a while, he couldn't remember what he had. <laughs> so he started uh, taking index cards, every new book he got, and making a bibliography record of that thing, who published it, when it came out, of the authors, and, and where he bought it, and uh, so on, a little summary of the content. And he carried this in a portable file cabinet, a little index card cabinet. And over the years, uh, he collected uh, these things, and he started getting shelving in the basement or in the roof and stuff. And uh, when they, uh, uh, when he held, you know, like 500 or something index cards, he published a bibliography of Western books by Jack D. Rittenhouse. Uh, and the thing of it is. When you're part of this association, if you can come up with anything mm -hmm. that is new and different, you put it off these people and you sell it. So he sold all of those. And uh, there are a lot of reviewers saying that Jack D. Rittenhouse's bibliography of Western books is the finest bibliography of that wow. type ever put together. Uh, that, what you mean? that was sometime in, in the 60s. It was right. when he was in Santa Fe. And it was also in that, in that period of time that he started uh, dabbling in book selling. Um, he, he, he started with a, a little particular genre of things. He collected this thing, he pulled up the, the thing. People would call him and uh, talk with him about the books, and then he would sell them to him. And he became interested in book selling. There's a, there's a booksellers association there, and he started going to the booksellers association. And uh, in the late '60s, uh, he he was he was pretty well known in in the Western market uh, because of his work with books and traveling around there. And um, during that during that time. Uh, it might, might have been, been in the might have been in the seventies, maybe after about the I might I might could have really started, but the governor of New Mexico was besieged by a local town to name part of their town as an historical site. But there was some question as to whether or not it actually qualified as being uh, in there. So the governor was fit to be tied because he had to approve it. He didn't know yes or no. And he's talking to a guy, and the guy says, well, you ought to get somebody who knows the West to look at it. And the guy says, you got a recommendation? He says, well, probably Jack Rittenhouse. Uh, so he called my father, 
and said, Mr. Woodhouse, I wish you would go look at this place and tell me if it qualifies. My father said, sure. So he went out, studied it, looked in the books, gave us up, called the governor, and said, uh, yeah, it qualifies because of this and the other. Hey, thank you. <laughs> that started uh, a, an association between Jack and the, and the governor of New Mexico, and it kind of continued. For the state of New Mexico, Jack Rittenhouse was kind of like the state historian, you might say. Uh, Any time there was a question about something or a thing that had to be involved, if somebody had to go somewhere to arbitrate or talk about some kind of thing, do it. So he went to you know, various things where he was asked by the state to participate in. And so all the while, um, during that time, was in, 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 um, I'm just trying to think back on, on the 50s. Oh, I, yeah, I skipped one important thing in the 50s. Um, in, in 1952, I guess it was, the big advertising agency in Los Angeles that he worked for, um, the president knew uh, a guy who was a big wheel at the Barrad Oil Company in Houston. Barrad Oil Company was a massive manufacturer of very drilling equipment. You ever seen the movie Giant? Mm -hmm. Know how all these people had their oil wells in the backyard and pumping out their drill, baby drill? Well, Barrad Oil made that stuff. Big, huge company, big, huge dollar volume stuff. Um, this, the guy President Bird wanted to set up like an in-house newspaper or catalog or something he could send out the place. Here's what's going on at Bear Ride and stuff. And um, uh, the guy he asked him if he could do it. And the guy said, well, he says, tell you what, if, if I have your account, I'll put a branch of our stuff in Houston. Talked to my father, he said, how'd you like to relocate to Kirsten and have this branch? You know, I bear it as an account, and then any other stuff that you bring up. Um, so my father said, oh, sure, okay, it's money. Yeah. So he and Charlotte, by that time he had two kids, they went off to Houston. And uh, for two years, uh, he was head of that company's advertising. Um, but then, uh, in, in 1955, uh, there was a, a big advertising company in Chicago. Uh, um, Marstetter Geberhart Reed was the name of the company. And they were huge in Chicago, and then they started setting up branches in the Midwest, and then they went, started moving to Texas. And they went down and looked over the Texas market, and if you really wanted to have a big account, you need to have barite oil. They talked to barite oil, and they said, no, we're doing all our stuff with Jack Rittenhouse. So they said, well, you know, if you can't beat him, join him. Um, so uh, they, they bought the rights to the branch from the uh, advertising company there uh, in Los Angeles. And so my father, uh, at that time, became uh, vice president of the of, of Marsteller, at a very good salary as the primary head of the branch, and uh, very liked him before, but now they really fell in love. He, he did a oh, a, pif a color pamphlet thing, uh, wrote a lot of the stuff himself, filled in a lot of it, it had kind of a western lore type of flavor to it about all the stuff. <laughs> Made a lot of money. Uh, that's that's what he told me. I can now afford to send you to college. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was able to go there. But as we've, you got, we've only got about five minutes here. Okay. So I, I wanted to give you kind of an alert that. Okay. Does that, does that mean we stop, or that means we change? Well, it can it can mean either. But uh, it depends on how much. If you can summarize, then that would be fine. If not. We can go on. 
Well, I can I can do another hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we haven't got to your part yet. Yeah, I've got to, I've got to my part, and, and you guys have a lot of chance to ask any question. I'm just as I told you, I I, 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 I spent a life of sales presentations, and I know my father's life well. And uh, what do you want to do? Uh, whatever. Uh, well, we, the next thing we have is two o'clock. Yeah. We got what two? I guess if we got out of here in another hour. That that'd be all right, wouldn't it? Yeah. Twelve thirty thereabouts. Okay, we'll just go ahead. How much contact so, did you have with your dad during this period? Uh, not not a great deal. <coughs> um, so most of these stories are from his journal or from what he told you. Well, he um, well I was. Let me go back. In 44, he left. The next time I saw him was in 48. Uh, his father died in Fort Wayne. He came to Chicago, picked me up. I went there. I met uh, some of the branch relatives or something. We spent some time together talking. Uh, the next year, in 49, he came to Chicago uh, for uh, to pick me up. He was supposed to be in Toronto, Canada for uh, four days for a convention type thing. Uh, he chose to come to Chicago, uh, pick me up, and then uh, drive me to Toronto. I spent four days with him at the convention. Uh, he wanted me to join him in California. Um, he had been after my mother saying, kind of s simplified, uh, I think David should have a, a choice of whether or not he wants to live with you or live with me. Uh, Did your mother remarry? My mother remarried in 45 uh, to a guy who was much more stable uh, than my father. Electrician, started working as an electrician in 33, uh, top notch electrician, was never unemployed in his entire life, never had a day out of work. Every time, went back, you know, paycheck every week. Yeah. He just, he just, uh, this, this she loved. Uh, they lived in Chicago, uh, and she, she was with him until his death in 1984. Actually, the, the, the second marriage for my father and mother was for the rest of their lives. Uh, he didn't have Charlotte until he died in 91, and uh, so on. So, second time around is, you know, better. But then in uh, 50, April of 1950, I went out to California, and I spent from, uh, February until July out there. Uh, the problem was my stepmother. My my stepmother treated me cordially but coldly, and uh, uh, we just didn't get along. My father in later years would tell me that that was one of the most frustrating periods of his life. Uh, women are just competitive and, and don't get along with other people's kids as well as they do their own. And whatever. So maybe in July, uh, it was the trial period was over, and I said, I, I think I want to go back home. Um, he came out when I was going to college. Um, he helped me pick my college, and he, he wrote me a letter. He said, uh, you know, you can go wherever you want, but I think that Beloit College in Beloit, Wisconsin, would be ideal for you because they've got a great English department. Uh, they're close enough to Chicago where you could drive home if you want to. Uh, it's it's only it's less than a thousand students, so you get better thing and stuff. And you know, but whatever you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I went to Blake College, and, and he drove me up there, and we spent some time then. Uh, then he came back. I was married in 1960, and he came to Chicago for that. Uh, and so it was, uh, you know, I, I was with him through my life uh, in person about, I'd say, 10 times. Each time was a few days to a week or something in addition to the other thing. Uh, every year he sent me a lengthy letter uh, to cover his stuff. Because of this historian mentality that he had, uh, it, was a, it was a habit of his every December to sit down and write a story of what had happened that year which enabled him later on, when he got into the you know, writing of his memoirs, uh, to be able to be accurate. And then the letter he would send to me would be like a mini letter. Uh, I always got one for my birthday. And then uh, miscellaneous stuff in between. 
But I was busy and he was busy. And to be honest with you, <coughs> I had a little bit of grudge at my father. Uh, my grandmother, after the divorce, once said to me that Jack got lured away from my mother by that woman he married. And, stuff. <laughs> and as a little kid, um, you know, I know he loved me, but I had a little bit of grudge against him with the fact that he and my mother still weren't married. Later on in life, as I went through the real world, I began realizing stuff that disappeared. But uh, uh, and then, you know, he got busy and I got busy, and. Now, at my age, I have five kids, and every one of them is totally under control, and everyone is a dynamo running in all these directions and doing all this stuff, and you just don't spend as much time, you know, together. It's just the way it is. And you all, all don't live in the... <coughs> They live everywhere, so you're the one, your son that lives here is the one that you have the closest contact with now. Well, now that my son, my son here left after he was the oldest, and and in eighty two, um, eighty three, uh, he left to go off with a guy building some some metal homes, uh, and he he built one in. Um, um, what's it called? May, Mayfield? May, down, down on 160 or 60, down about, about Marshfield. Uh, Marshfield. They built a metal building in Marshfield, and that was done, and they had a couple of weeks layover, and he came to Springfield. He just fell in love with Springfield. So it's not wrong with that. He had done some printing, and uh, he, he was a. a well, above average rookie printer, and he went to work for printing outfit here in Springfield. And over the next five years, uh, worked for about two or three, and then uh, after about six years, uh, we were a Palm Warner company here at that time was the largest employer in Springfield, with 1,300 people. Uh, they uh, they lost their printer, and uh, the legend goes that uh, the head of the company. Uh, called in uh, his, his one of his major paper suppliers and said, "You deal with a lot of printers here in St. Louis, uh, here in Springfield. Uh, who, who, in your opinion, is the is the best printer in in Springfield? <coughs> and you can name two or three guys I can give you." And he says, "Well, uh, Ed Rittenhouse is about doubt the best." And then there's the other two guys, and they called in. They talked to Ed, and they just liked Ed so much they hired him. And Ed's been there now for 20 years, and um, he's very proud of the fact that uh, they rate people on a scale of one through five, with five being the best, uh, on their annual review. And he's been a five for the last seven years, and he's part of a five percent group in there to get a raise every year. But he now runs a whole print shop, and he understands every machine in there and he just moves around and take care of considers it his own company and everybody out there just climbing, you know, stuff. But, uh, so are you the keeper of your father's stuff? Uh, well, everybody in the family has got a copy of it and I put all these on a disc uh, and that's part of the family. Right. Um, I've also, uh, have you ever thought of having this published? Uh, no, uh, it's a, you know, it's a limited market. In fact, the, um, the thing about this was that he thought he'd do it, but he didn't, he didn't feel like doing it uh, chronologically. Um, I, I don't know where all he said, mostly he did this for the family, but he might have given some to some other people. I'm sure he did. He wrote it topically. Uh, it starts with uh, his early his college years and his magic experiences and his wonder year and the war years and books and I and all this stuff. He did his topics. And part of the problem I've had in developing his part of his biography is to do it chronologically, which is the way I'm doing it. You have to dig through all these different things. You pick up a piece here and a piece there and somewhere else. Uh, but that's never been done. But I've also, uh, I recently put the, my entire picture collection of the old days on uh, 12 discs, 
three thousand wow. photographs. Good. Yeah, I just read this one book here to show somebody. In fact, um, this is all the family. This is me. It's a little kid and all this stuff. Hmm. And uh, I, I am a believer in what my father said about biographies. You know, uh, I talk to people and. Some of them will say, gee, I wish I knew more about the family. And um, so I've got all the stuff from my father that I picked up from this. And of course, my memories, and I've talked somewhat about my mother with my mother and the sisters. And as a major breakthrough, <coughs> um, there was a guy um, who, who buried a, a, a close friend of my grandfather, uh, Grandpa Shear, the guy who had the store and house and stuff, and lived next door to them and worked with them and was like one of the family. And uh, he, he was 80 years old, and my cousin Debbie was talking with him about the old days, and he recorded a, a two-hour tape for my cousin talking about my grandfather and all the things that he remembered from that job and stuff about the family. And my cousin gave it to me. And from that, I, I am able to put together a very good segment of the 20s and some stuff about the great grandparents. And so it's a major work. Because like my father, you know, when I, when I started at Interlake in 1959, I worked in the National Sales Office. And I can, I can see all of us in the sales office and engineering things spread around on this, uh, you know, 1,000 square foot top floor of the main building. Uh, steel desks, manual crank type adding machines, uh, steno pool, <laughs> you know, the, the culture of the times, top rate. But today, it's as primitive as a caveman, you know, and stuff. Uh, over the last 50 years, the change in the environment and the change in complexity that, um, you know, today's generations can't imagine what it was like in those days. Now, I don't, I don't know what it's worth to be able to tell the tales of the crank type adding machines and stuff that went on. But um, the thing that bores me is that uh, my, I have five grandchildren, and that maybe one of my grandchildren may have a son who someday would like to know, gee, what was it like 120 years ago? Mm -hmm. Because when I figure out, the, the son of my grandson, when he gets old, will be coming into the year 2300. And he might be interested to know what it was like in 1902. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, um, <coughs> let, me, let me just finish up with a couple other things about my father. Um, when, when my father was at the University of New Mexico Press, uh, they hired him because of his tremendous experience in the West as well as his knowledge of book selling and book publishing and all kinds of stuff. And so he taught a couple of classes uh, at the University of New Mexico Press in addition to his major work. And um, uh, one of the classes uh, was on book publishing and one was on, well, printing and stuff and so on. Uh, his primary work was people would come in to the press with uh, recommendations for books to be printed by the press. In order to have this thing, the press had to be uh, picking from like uh, elite type ideas or unusual things or so on. And Jack was able to do that. Uh, while he was there, he met a guy who was a very, became a, a, one of his best friends, a fellow by the name of Tony Hillerman. Guy was well, well known in Western <coughs> publishing. Uh, in, 
in, two, in 1990, uh, Tony Hillerman um, was called in by his, uh, his publisher and said, Tony, uh, I have an idea for a book for you. Uh, a book called like The Real West or The Best of the West or something. Authentic articles, uh, reports, written in the old days by people who had gone through unique adventures of the 1800s in the Old West. And then you, you will put a, an introduction to each one of these tales in the book. And Tony said, well, that's a good idea, but I can't do that. I, I can't find the content for it. He said, by no man who can, a guy by the name of Jack Rittenhouse. So he went to my father and he said, I'll tell you what, I'll pay you $10,000. Uh, you select for me the most interesting stories written by somebody who went to it, and then I'll do a thing for the book. And my father did that. And out of that came this book. <laughs> now you was telling me about this. So my father, my father said, now, I, I, my name's going to be on it, but you, you got to have your name on it for what you did. And Jack said, absolutely not. No, this will be your book, not mine. Uh, and I insist on it. Tony when said, was this published? Um, in 1992. 92. after uh, your dad passed away then. Yeah, in fact, uh, I talked to my dad by phone um, about <coughs> two weeks before he died. He died of cancer in 92. Uh, he, he first had cancer in, a year before, and then it went into remission, and then it popped up uh, in uh, 91. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tony insisted on, uh, in, on giving Jack credit for all the work he did in the introduction that it was. So he was in that book. It's fascinating. Did one of the stories is John Steinbeck's description of Highway 66 oh. in that book. According to the, the line on the board we have there. Huh. So it all comes around. Yeah. He writes a book on Route 66, 1946, and in 1992, there's a book that he's involved in, one of the stories that Paul you submitted to Tony Herman. Well, last, this was the last thing he did. Right, right. that was the last thing he did, yes. And so that one of the last things he did was put a story by Steinbeck about Route 66 back in. So and so, so uh, right, what, what, what was, was the title of the book and who published it? The book was The Best of the West by Tony Herman, an anthology of classic writing in the American West, published in 1992. Uh, and the story... There was one of the stories that submitted was John Steinbeck's description of Highway 66. Does it give a publisher? The publisher was Curtis Brown Limited. Just want to document it. That's Good. Man. That's the publisher in the UK. Um, marketing campaign was for National Advertising in the American West, Old West, Drew West, and Texas Monthly. It was a book of the month club selection. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I know the American publisher. Easy enough to find. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, here it says Best of the West is co publishing venture with the Book of the Month Club. Okay. <clears throat> Which is, you know, what, what I'm finding so fascinating about your story and your dad's story is that um, it's more than a footnote, but this was one thing out of the hundreds and hundreds of things he did. I'm almost thinking the New Mexico press might be interested in your dad's story because it just connects. That's why I was thinking. That's why I was asking. New Mexico press? Well, it's not about the university. Well, not about the stage was University of New Mexico press. Yeah. You know, they, they were involved in publishing or uh, recreating this, so they had some knowledge of your dad, and there was a lot of stuff through the New Mexico presses and things that he was involved in. It just seems that they may be a source of someone who say, you know what, we've got some interest in something. Well, there. you were saying there were a lot of people that are involved in <clears throat> the American West and all, like I was telling you when I talked to you about my dad, and he, mm -hmm. he was a big Zane Gray and John Fox. And uh, <clears throat> you, you said your dad realized that if they printed something, there was a group of people to be interested. Well, I would think that a book about <clears throat> the life and times of Jack D. Rittenhouse might not be a New York bestseller, but 
to the people interested in this stuff that it, that would be a a very popular book. I, I think there's a, there's a contact person. Uh, David Dunaway is yeah, it? Dr. David Dunaway. He's he's the one that does this nationally. That we the archives and that, and he's located in Albuquerque. Well, at the university, um, so he would be a contact. So yeah. something is something I haven't gotten to. Uh, at his, at his death, uh, because of all the things we're doing about so many people knowing him. In fact, uh, there. Well, uh, I keep wanting to go off on any of five or six different tangents on these things. At his death, he donated all of his papers, all of this, uh, to the archives of the state of New Mexico. Uh, also, during the years that uh, he and Charlotte were driving around in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, specializing in New Mexico, uh, he took a lot of pictures probably a couple thousand pictures probably uh, of the state of New Mexico of old historic things wanting to have a picture of a New Mexico town in 1950s so that in the year 2000 you would be able to compare it. And he donated all of his pictures to the state of New Mexico and the state of New Mexico has a Jack D. Rittenhouse picture website wow. that you can go to. And I don't know, they got like 100 or 150 pictures or the, something. The state of New Mexico has that. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with like that. There's some central thing in there where they have the proof of what, what goes in there. And along with that, one of the things he's most proud of, and he was reciprocant of the Paso Key, uh, uh, Pasaporta Key Award, which the Spanish is passed by here, which comes from the fact that uh, somewhere in the 1800s, uh, a Mexican uh, went up on the top of a very high rocky bluff, big huge rocky bluff, stayed overnight, and when he left the next morning, uh, scrolled the date in there with a stone, carved it in the stone, started his name, and then put Pasaporta Key, which is on this date I passed by here. Well, um, you have to forgive me, I sort of break up at this point. Uh, the, the state of New Mexico established a, what they call a Pasaporta Key Award, and uh, my father was the reciprocant of that reward. Hmm. Very special. Yeah, very special. The, uh, the subject is, because this man passed by here, the state of New Mexico is better than right. it was. Absolutely. Hmm. And uh, you know, so the, the, what happened was, in, when he moved, he moved from Santa Fe to New Mexico, to Albuquerque, in 68 when he joined the press, because that's where they were located. And um, in 1978, he retired uh, from the press, and they sent a, a, um, a notice of his retirement out to about 150 people, uh, suppliers and, and people who were no longer with the press, and it asked anybody else uh, for a, uh, a book, uh, for, a, for a letter of, uh, you know, we'll miss you right, and right. all this type of stuff. And uh, somewhere here in, amongst all the stuff, you know, they sent me a copy of all these things that they made. And uh, the, uh, the amount of praise that he got was just uh, uh, considerable. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, at that time, after he retired and was in Albuquerque, uh, he really got into his book selling. And they, when they moved to Albuquerque, they bought a, uh, a two apartment, uh, like a two flat. But they, they, they didn't, they, the contractor who built it, when he built it, planned on having uh, one of them for rental and would live in the other. But just about the time he got done building it, the uh, city of Albuquerque, uh, changed the uh, zoning and zoned the area of his two flat as being a non, uh, all residential, no rental. So here the guy is with a two flat. 
something they can't use. And <laughs> they can't use. And for a while, he had his mother living in one of them, and then she died, and then he wanted to go somewhere. My father came in, and he sold it to my father for a real good deal. My father wanted it because he took the other half and made it his business. Uh, filled all the rooms with shelving and put all his books in there and started buying more rare books and getting in there uh, and became uh, a full-fledged bookseller. Uh, he, in his writings to me, one of the things he says, um, there is a movie that basically if you see this movie, it tells a story of what I do. It's a book called 84 Children Cross Circle. Uh, have you ever seen that movie? I haven't. You've have heard of it, and I've seen part of it, but I haven't. Say that again. 84, uh, I think it's C-H-A-R-I-N-G. I think it's two R's. Two R's. I -N -G. Sharing Cross Circle. That's the address of a bookseller in London. And uh, uh, Anne Bancroft um, was the star of it. She played a woman in New York who was very interested in old books couldn't find a certain category of those books anywhere, saw an ad in a journal about uh, a bookseller in London at that address, wrote him a letter and said, have you got those books? And he wrote back and said, yes, I do. And in fact, if you like that type of book, uh, you might also like this and that. And uh, that began a 20-year association uh, between that woman and this bookseller in which uh, she and I really bought a lot of books, but they got together and knew each other and so on. But my father said, that basically now is my life in retirement. Uh, I'm here, I'm collecting these books, I'm getting them. He had ads and all kinds of papers about him being available. And people would call him and say, have you got this book? And he'd say, yes. Uh, and um, he would uh, then say, well, you know, if you like that, do that. Or they'd say, is it really true that that happened? You say, well, it may or may not be because of this other thing and so on. And uh, so this gave him the, uh, the legend in the Bookseller Association as one of the leading bookseller historians uh, of Western works. He likes to tell the story that um, one day in the late 80s, uh, he was invited to speak at one of the gatherings, uh, speak on a certain subject, and when the guy introduced him, he said, and now I'd like to uh, introduce you to Jack D. Rittenhouse, the leading historian of Western books. And afterwards, uh, Jack went over to him and he said, uh, I, th I think you overly grand grandized my introduction. I'm not the leading historian. The guy looked at Jack and said, certainly I are. Who else? And Jack said, well, there's Billy so-and-so, and I said, no, nope, died last week. <laughs> he says, how about Tom? Tom's one, too. He said, I got me the hand a little bit. Well, I just wanted help, but that's it. That's it. <laughs> now, so, uh, he, because, because of what he did, because of what he had done, and all this stuff, um, he had a, a lot of uh, people who liked him. One, one thing that he admitted to me, I, I went out there, visited him um, about two months before he passed away. Because, um, mm -hmm. he was, uh, yeah, 78, 78. Oh, 1978? No, he was 78. Right. But he was, was in 91. 91. February of 91. Um, I told him, I said, uh, you know, we've all said that, that someday you should show me around some of your favorite historical rocks and caves and things in New Mexico, and uh, maybe this might be the time. So I went out there and spent some time with him. And while we were riding around, uh, he was admitting something to me that, he said, we really love Charlotte, but um, Charlotte was just not a social person. She just didn't like having groups over and type stuff. And he said that the one thing that he missed out on would he would have liked to have had um, uh, a Saturday morning get together of the great minds of Western literature. <laughs> Sit around his front room and talk about 
their f favorite books and different thinking and observations, but she didn't want to do it. And that was about the only thing he didn't do, the thing he would have really liked to have had. But who was the marshal you told me about that was in 1880 or something, and he had found a book about him? And Oh. Um, I was trying to remember that. Well, um, because he was in this book sale mode, um, and because he liked to get out of the house, uh, he would go on trips and he would visit bookstores. He'd go to the, any bookstore in any town that had a major collection of old books, and he'd prowl through the racks, and if he wanted to have four copies of a certain Zane Gray book, uh, and he's down to two, he would look someplace <laughs> with <laughs> and those two books, replenish his stock, as he called them. And he also looked for nuggets of books that were, and he tells the tale of, uh, he walked into an old general store out in the desert somewhere this one day to get a soda. And they had some books in the back, and he went back there and he looked at these books, and he was amazed. On this shelf were, were two prime condition books about a guy who, who was a, uh, uh, he was an Indian scout, and I guess in his youth he had been with Custer uh, and done some things, and then he went off to stay. Left just in time. <laughs> right now. <laughs> That's a good point, yeah. And uh, in his old age, uh, he would tell people tales about his scouting stuff. And everybody kept saying, you know, you ought to write a book about your stuff. So this, uh, so around here, my father went over the road in there, and he says, he says, what's this book here? And she says, uh, uh, that's my great-grandfather. Uh, he wrote this book. People kept saying, you ought to write this book. And he did, he did this book. And he had it pri uh, privately penned. And uh, we still got some copies. And so I put them out here. And every so often, I saw one. And my father says, you wanted a uh, dollar for it. No, it wanted, I don't know, that'd be a dollar for it, yeah. And um, so my, my father said to her, uh, well, these are in good shape. He says, have you got a lot of them? And she said, yeah, we have about five cartons down in the basement. And so he says, well, why don't you take for all of them? You know, he gave him 500 bucks for the five cartons. <laughs> Brought out and cleaned the car. He put him on the uh, on his mailing list as being in the fine, and he wanted twenty bucks a piece for him. He sold all of them. Imagine what your father would have done with the internet and eBay and all that, and moving books that way. Ah, I, I don't know that anything that well, or you think these mailing lists? I there's there's uh, that's a I don't want to get off of that. So the internet has has made a lot of buying and selling so crass and commercial right. and right. easy and stuff. And expensive. Yeah, and, and a, lot, you know, a lot of the status of guys like he did. He's got the personal contact. He had another story that he told me, uh, he, he came to Chicago. He, he would go out uh, and, and look at estates. There would be people who were in the, the book collecting business, have a lot of books on the West, and then they'd die. And a lot of times they'd have an estate sale. And uh, he knew, he'd keep track of these things. And there was a, a guy in Chicago uh, who was, had a uh, batch of books that were left in his estate. And so his widow sent out a notice to uh, the organization that kind of forwarded these things to people that was going on and give a list of all the books he had. And uh, my father <coughs> looked at this, this list and saw a lot of stuff on there that he, he would like to have, but he couldn't afford. He said, every time we went to the estate sales, there was one guy who had a lot of money, and he came there, and if it was a really prime book, he just outbid everybody else. And so Jack knew the 10% of it he just couldn't afford to buy. And then there'd be about another 10% that he'd love to buy if he lucked into it, like a high draft choice or something. <laughs> and then just a lot of stuff replenish the stock. But he says, I saw this one weird one. It was something like uh, the 1898 
Colorado uh, Book of Congressional Records. And um, he says, I don't know if that's a, a, a big dog or a little dog or what's going on. But anyway, he just passed by it. Well, that weekend, there was a librarian convention uh, in, in Los Angeles uh, for a lot of the western states where the, the college, mostly college libraries and state our libraries got together. And Jack knew a lot of these people and a lot of them knew him because libraries are one of the big sources right. to sell books. And so he went there and uh, while he was wandering around talking to people, the guy who headed up the library of the University of uh, Colorado State University uh, came over to him and he said, Jack, I need your help. And I said, what? He says, I got $1,000 left in my budget to buy something for the library. I need some kind of really unique book. My father says, well, how about the 1898 congressional record of the state of Colorado? I says, damn, hey, yo, you think you could get me that? He says, well, it's out of the state. It's going to cost a lot of money, but I can get it for you, I think. So he, I says, yeah, if you can get it, I'll take it. So Jack went to this, this, this thing here, and they started auctioning off these books. And of course, all the really prime stuff, this guy with all the money is bidding this stuff and taking them all. And then it comes time for this book of congressional record. And uh, so Jack threw in 50 bucks. And uh, the guy with all the money looked at him like he'd go crazy. And so he says, uh, 100. And uh, Jack said, 150. And the guy looked at Jack. He says, he must know something. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he gave you throw with a buck and see what happened. <laughs> so Jack threw in 200. And this guy looked back, and you could just see him saying, I don't care what he knows, I'm not going to throw 250 into that thing. So Jack got the thing for 200, came back and sold the book for $1,000 to the University of Colorado. And that was, you know, one of his trophy sales. Right, right. Yes. Yeah, and that, that was how he spent his last years. In fact, he, he took on the, uh, he, you know, people say, what do you do? I'm a bookman. And he became known as a book man. Did he leave all his books to uh, New Mexico? Uh, no. You, you hooked up your... Now you're calling the bottom hall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now what happened was, um, when, when he, in, in the, in the winter of 1990, uh, he, he got pains in his lower abdomen and um, he went to the doctor and the doctor ran into a big series of tests and he says, you have a very unusual disease. You have cancer of the penis. Really? And uh, he said, uh, it hasn't spread anywhere else, although it may have gone into lymphomatics system, we can't really tell you, but uh, we will have to remove your penis. And um, Jack later on told me, he says, uh, I, I would have to tell a few friends about that from time to time, and I always say to them, uh, I may mean, have to lose my penis, but nobody had any interest in it for so many years, it's <laughs> 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 But um, uh, Right after that, he came home and he said, even though I was in remission, uh, I had the feeling that, you know, it could very likely come back. And they told me it might come back. He said, so uh, one day I sent out a notice to all of the book collectors that I knew with a notice that I was selling my mailing list. Oh, okay. And he says, and everybody at that time knew that I was probably going to die pretty soon for some reason, because that's the only reason the guy would sell his mailing list. He sold the mailing list, and then uh, in the first part of 1991, in the months preceding his desk, uh, he put all of his books on sale. He s tried to sell off his whole stock at, you know, 50%, 60% off, and began getting big orders and stuff. <laughs> when, I, when I visited him um, right before he passed on, 
uh, we we go we go on tour and stuff. But uh, a number of mornings we worked out of his office. Uh, his, his energy level was low sure. because of his condition, and uh, we'd go around and he'd tell me what books he wanted. I'd take a cart and I'd pull the books, and then I'd box them up, and he'd do an invoice and put them in there. Sure, but when I would take two uh, carts full of books over me all that. So uh, I know that he sold most of his, his real goodies. Right, right. And what he sold of his stock, I really don't know. But uh, it, it is, um, I, I have said to my kids uh, and, and to some other people when it comes up, they say, um, uh, I, I tell them, I said, my legacy is, is in my children. And one guy said to me, he says, what do you mean? What do you, what do you, what do you I said, well, I am personally very lucky to be born uh, as, the, as, as his son and, and also my mother, who her family is just magnificent. We, we really don't have any bad people in my family. They were all good people. Uh, and they all treated themselves wonderful and treated the family well and treated me well. Uh, and I have inherited uh, a lot of skills and attitudes for which I take no credit at all uh, that whatever success and quality of life I've had has been because of what I've got. And I say to my kids, I say, look, um, you know, you are all talented people and good quality people yourself. And I think that in part it's you, and in part it's because you have been given the basic DNA and, and, and background to be a good person. So in part, uh, be proud of yourself. Great attitude, great philosophy of life. So that's why I'm doing uh, you know, some of this stuff here. Now, at this point, I mean, uh, there's, there's a couple things that I found that you can take with you. Okay. These are some reprints of things that uh, you will read. Yeah, I'll take you. Okay, yeah. I'll take this. And um, that's from an article about him. Um, here's one from the L. Uh, here's his. Um, some things you got this up there. Here's your other one. And then after he died, uh, Bookman's Weekly magazine uh, wrote this. And that. And, and this one here. Uh, those three uh, talk uh, about what a wonderful guy he was. Um, talk about some of the things of his life that I have discussed here. Uh, it was also from my, I, I started a thing called the Root House Family Album, which I aborted because <laughs> I couldn't get copy machines in those days to reproduce these pictures well. First one is a Bantam, yeah. and the Trippin 41 out there. Second one is a Yeah. It, yeah, they are. I was in the back seat, and we were there a whole row. One row of the back seat, right? Like, especially in the trunk. Like and that's what you sat on. Yeah, I, I, I sat in between the two seats. Well, I was sat back there. I just remember sitting in the two seats. Second page is a picture of my father uh, in the uh, California uh, National Guard. And me uh, and another. Third picture is a better picture of that Bannon. Did you do the, the script? Did you write it? Yeah, I wrote it. Okay. Well, my intention was to do all 3,000 uh, photographs covering the whole history of the family with a writing up above it to explain wow. what was going on in that picture. But um, after I got it done, I, I was going to third person. What I wanted to do is I wanted to give them the original, the paper with a paste up over it of the photograph which they can only run through the copy machines like manually mm -hmm. or if I made a copy of a certain type and they ran through it. And all the ways to do it had any adequate reproduction of the pictures. Now these were made uh, a couple of days ago over at Staples and I marveled at how much better these were than the ones of 10 years ago. And they said, well, we're just all better now. Uh, the picture, this picture here, was taken uh, about 1948. 
uh, in a, we got, you know, 47. Seven. 47, when he was in a advertising, uh, the Dynamics Clark Agency is the one he worked for, they put the branch in Houston. And he was uh, a chairman of the meeting uh, of uh, some advertising guys. This was taken, uh, we're shaking hands with the guy who introduced him or something, and then the gavel. That's what he looked like at the time that uh, he did the, the book, and which is also the same picture on the right, which he used when he went out to Los Angeles to try and get a job. And then uh, on the next to last page, as him holding a sword, mm. he collected uh, old guns and old swords, among other stuff, uh, and there was a presentation sword uh, from the, given the general. The last, the next to last, the next to last page, in 1958, after I left college, I went down to Houston. Uh, that's when I left off. After I left college, he said, come down to Houston, and I'll see if I can get you on with some outfit down there. Uh, I tried for about three months down there, and uh, uh, <coughs> came, didn't, that didn't work out down there, he came back to Chicago. The last page, there's the Stagecoach Press on the right. Uh, this was his print shop in the Houston facility. Uh, that, that's the handset press over here hmm. that he used to print the Stagecoach wow. Press. And some of the stuff down there, those are the mallets and things that he used to put right. in the little type. The tie. In fact, through the, uh, through the, um, this one here, uh, I just flicked through it the other day. Um, one, of the, one of these pages, you know, these little things, these were things yeah, that you could buy. Little characters. One of them was a line drawing of a stagecoach, and uh, he used that on all of his other stuff uh, going through it. And uh, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Well, it's a great story. Yeah, great yeah. story. Now I got a question. Okay. Uh, I was looking at these pictures up here. Yes. That Remington is that the name of it? That steel guitar there. No guitar. That's a Barrington guitar. Barrington. Okay. I couldn't. Is that the same one up here? And uh, well, this first picture on the left, and then the second one. No. It didn't. I was looking at that, and I thought that might be the same guitar. No, that's, um, well, the first one, uh, it's just me in college. Um, the, the first one was an acoustic guitar with a pickup in it. Yeah. One, down below that was a jazz guitar, a bird guitar, uh, designed by um, uh, two guitarists. Uh, a guitar, a guy named Billy Bird and a fellow named Hank Garland. Uh, Hank Garland, there's a video out about his life. He was a great guitarist, but he went crazy. Uh, the second picture, Les Paul in uh, 1950, um, they developed a, the first real solid body jazz rock guitar, yeah. of which that was an original one that I bought used in 54. Don't still have and, uh, it, do you? No, I, I saw it <laughs> as I marched on. The, the, most, the most unique one, um, that's the chord. Is uh, that that um, the second one extreme left? Uh, I <coughs> I found uh, Les Paul, Lady of Spain, 1951. Uh, I heard that thing, and I I heard all those guitars cascading the wall and stuff. I says, Wow, man. And uh, then in 1952, um, I, I, my, my Aunt Virginia was a wonderful person. My mother was kind of cerebral. She was like her grand, she was like her father. Uh, she, she was like her mother. She was, she was sunny and just unflappable and never bothered her and a wonderful person to be around. My mother took more after her father, who was more straight-laced and, and so on. Uh, and I loved my Aunt Virginia. So I get to, to go out and spend summers with her and my three cousins. And uh, in the summer of 52, at the end of it, Forrest, who was a smooth finisher, um, 
was given a chance to go down to South Carolina and work on uh, an atomic energy uh, high water plant outside Aiken, South Carolina. Uh, Eisenhower uh, was been nominated for president and the Cold War was in full swing and the United States was obsessed in getting their nuclear program really on the way. And so they sent this facility there and they wanted it done like now. And so Forrest was offered this thing, uh, what they call uh, uh, seven, seven twelves. You could work as much as 12 hours a day or any portion of 12 hours you wanted, seven days a week. Hey. And here they were 40 hours of double time. So that's three weeks pay in one, one week. Absolutely. Yeah. And they had several million square feet of concrete floor. <laughs> So Forrest and a whole number of cement finishers headed down to Aiken. And I was having a great time with the Brunsons, my, my Forrest Brunson, who was my wife's sister, my mother's sister. And uh, they said, you want to come along? And I said, I'd love to. They talked to my mother and stepfather, and they said, well, OK, if you want to. And so I went down there with them and uh, spent time down there. And then I heard Chet Atkins down there. Oh, man. Oh, what a good time. Was, Chet was just brand new to the market. And uh, then I came. Then after that job was done, we went up to Piketon, Ohio. <coughs> Piketon, Ohio, was, uh, also had a million square foot of floor in an actual uranium manufacturing plant, uh, of which the main assembly room of the final steps of Uranium development is a million square foot by itself. And uh, I spent uh, a year there. I was two years away from Chicago. And during that time, uh, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, because in my youth, I really was never around a lot of kids. And when I came to Chicago, uh, it was all cliques, you know, hard to get into stuff and so on. But in those two environments, um, there would be like 300 construction workers sailing in with house trailers and stuff. And trailer parks were blossoming out of cornfields, you know. And the schools would suddenly get 300 new students this year. And many kids knew each other. There were no cliques. We were all strangers to each other. And it was, it was uh, during that two years, my socialization skills really improved. And during those two years in Ohio, all I heard was country music down there, and which is all guitars. So that's where I started playing guitar. But then when I got back to Chicago, uh, I fell in love with jazz. Uh, I heard the Dave Brubeck Quartet for their first album. And uh, I, I was fascinated by the way that they, they talked musically with each other as they're playing. Were you aware that Les Paul and Mary Ford started here in Springfield? I, I don't have, I have no time constraints on that. On it's just <coughs> getting to the next They point. started with, uh, on KWTO, and then I think went to Chicago. Well, and Chet Atkins started here. I know uh, I and mean, Jethro were here. For, yeah, well, and Chet came Chet here. Chet came here. Yeah. And KWTO was owned by Ralph Foster, who owns the Ralph, or uh, donated the money for the Ralph Foster Museum down School of the Old mm -hmm. Arts. Yeah. And they fired Chad Atkins. Yeah. <laughs> and he went to Nashville from here. <laughs> and Homer came to, to Chet after his hire and says, he says, Chet, don't worry about it. We've been fired from no radio station. We don't want any bad water. I have to ask you one thing. Yeah. How many times have you played Route 66 on the guitar? Um, to be real honest with you, I, I never played it at all until the last 10 years of Borders. It was, uh, we have a, the one in that picture on the wall is a picture of the Borders group. And uh, she liked to sing Route 66. So we did it uh, a lot during that 10 year period. But before that, it was just never a thing that we did. I just had to ask, so. <laughs> well, <I'm glad> <laughs> Good question. But I'm a big fan of Judy London, who married Bobby Trude, who was the guy who wrote it. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but 
Our net controls version. Yeah. True. That was uh, actually the first one, wasn't it? I don't know. Well, Julie never did it. Uh, but that did it. Yeah. And a lot, a lot of people have done it because it's, it's a good swing song. But in, uh, when I was in college, which is the top couple pictures there, uh, I was I started playing guitar in ensemble rather than with other people, and that was that was like my Boy Scout year for my father. Uh, when you've got other musicians that you can play with in groups and some little places to play, the, the, the third one I was, we played in a concert. Uh, all the fraternities and sororities had a little segment to go up and do it. We represented the Sigma Pi fraternity and played in front of the whole school. The fourth one is was done. It was a place called the Pop Shop. It was a non-alcoholic uh, college get together. I was 18 in Madison to drink, but it was uh, 21 in, in uh, Beloit, and played there. And then when I, when I came back to Chicago. On uh, day after New Year's of 1959, uh, a buddy of mine says, let's go look for some girls. And uh, he was over 21. And I said, well, I can't go. I'm, I'm only 20. And he said, well, I got a false ID here for you. I'll get to it. <laughs> so uh, he, he said, let's, let's go out to the place. There's a place called Blondie's in Hegwish. That uh, is, they got a real swinging group out there. You'll like them. Uh, they're older, but uh, they play really good stuff. Very energetic. Went out there, uh, trio, accordion, uh, drums. I mean, I played saxophone and clarinet. They were a lot of a group, a lot of fun. And I got talking to the accordion player at the break, and he says, um, "Why don't you come out and sit in with us sometime?" And um, okay, so next weekend I came out there with my stuff. And uh, went up and sat in a set with them, and they like what I was doing, because I, I know how to play guitar. I, I was doing a lot of bass playing, too, playing, putting the, turn the bass up on the amp and play bass parts with some. And they really needed a bass player, so I played a lot of bass parts. And they really liked what I did, and they said, come on back next week. <laughs> so I went back the next week, and then they talked to Blondie, and then they hired me. So I... Uh, Five. Okay. Uh, that second picture on the left, I, all through, 60, 61, 62, and 63, I played bass and guitar uh, with different groups. And at, um, in the fall of 63, uh, I got tired of picking up the guitar and putting it down and picking up the bass and putting it down. I called Gibson because I had seen some other manufacturer uh, who made a bass guitar neck and a regular guitar neck on the same body. And I thought, well, that's a great idea, but it was a lousy instrument, hard to play. I called Gibson, said, have you ever thought about making one like that? And they said, well, you are lucky because we made a prototype for the National Musician, the National Musical Instrument Show, and everybody liked it, so we cut the body for it, and we're going to start marketing it. If you want one, you'll have the third one that comes off the line. Wow. So they sent me a drawing, and I marked it up for some changes, and they made that one, and I played that for seven years, and everywhere I went for seven years, there was an attraction. Oh, sure. <laughs> the other was playing weddings, and then the third one in the center, uh, that woman drummer uh, had been working with an all-girl group, and she said, working with women is nothing more than a giant pain in the butt. <laughs> they always, the kids are always getting hurt and they can't show up, or they have their period, or their husband yelled at them, and they're emotionally distraught. And she said, I want to get with guys. So she got with me and accordion player. We played together for five years. Uh, but well, we probably need to wrap this up. Let, let me ask you, you know, to make some kind of summary statement if you'd like to. And, and the other thing, and many of this could be the tie-in. Have you ever used your dad's book to do Route 66? No, no, I never have. I, yeah, um, I was in California one time. There's a golf course outside Carmel that goes down right in the ocean. You got to be fifteen dollars to get a ride around it. Uh, I mentioned to a waitress there in town. There was a gorgeous place, uh, and she stopped and she said, "Well, I live down there. You know, come think of it." She says, "I guess it is pretty nice." 
and I can't even realize that she was just so used to it. Right, right. And the stuff that my father has done is a lot like that. I mean, I'm so used to it that I just never talk about him. But, you know, when somebody wants to talk about him, if they're interested, I can do hours and hours of stuff. He was a remarkable individual. Everybody, the, the big thing that the people all said in the, uh, in the referrals was that Jack was a, a gentle human being who loved everybody, and he was basically a teacher personality. When people came to see him uh, and ask about stuff, he was more than happy to help them. If he didn't know the answer, so he'd be more than happy to look it up. Uh, and, and he would explain complicated stuff in a very simple, understandable manner, which is part of the reason why everybody liked him and yeah. spoke so well of him in his passing. And a major life, more than just the book. Major yeah. life. And I'm happy to contribute the insight on anything that seems to praise of the man on the radio. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Really, I really appreciate your time, and it was very interesting. I, uh, <coughs> I thought when I... Uh, well, it's your daughter-in-law, Helen, that when I saw her name, I thought that would be very interesting. But when I talked to her and then talked to your son, he said, no, I need to talk to you, that you would know more than he would and everything. So that was why I approached about doing this interview, and it's been very interesting. How did you, how'd, how'd you get over there in the first place? Helen worked at Great River Associates, Great River and Associates. Is that the engineering type? Yeah, out there, over out there off the battlefield. Yeah. And they were doing a corridor management plan for the association so we can go to the National Scenic Byway. And uh, I guess she was saw some of the stuff or something or the couple of people we was working with mentioned, or mentioned 66, and she said, well, the woman that told me about it said, well, her father-in-law was Jack Rittenhouse. <clears throat> well, anyway, I called out there two or three weeks ago, and she no longer works there. She works at Mueller's. Mm -hmm, yeah. Got a job there. And so I said, well, could you give me a phone number? And they said, well, they'd have to check and see. And the peep, I told her who it was, and she said, well, the girl, uh, this Jeremy Jackson that helped on the corridor management plan, <clears throat> she called me back and she said, I'll call her and have her call you. Well, that was like on Thursday or Friday and by Sunday evening she hadn't called. She told me she'd gone to Mueller's and everything. So I uh, looked in the, said she lives here in town. Well, I looked in the phone book for Rittenhouse I only saw two that lived in Springfield, so that simplified it quite a bit. But of course, while I don't buy lottery tickets, I called one of two people, and that wasn't the one. So I narrowed it down, and I talked to your daughter-in-law, and she said, "Well, I said I don't see that there's a problem, but said it's uh, my father-in-law's dad said it's my husband's grandfather." And she said, I'll talk to him and he'll call you. So your son called me in a little bit when he got home. And I told him what I was wanting to hang. He said, well, you, there's no need me talking to you because I don't know that much, really. He said, not like my dad would, said you need to talk to him. Well, <clears throat> I didn't figure you lived any place near Springfield. And he said, he just moved to Springfield, I thought he said a couple of years ago, so I thought, well, we'll pursue it. And he said, would it help if I called and told him you're going to call? And I said, well, I'd appreciate that because just to hit him out of the blue, you know, about that. And so I guess he called you and talked to you and everything. So I was glad to get this.